So here in Mark chapter 12, in the life of Jesus Christ, we have this interaction that takes place between Jesus and the religious leaders of the day. Now remember, the religious, these guys, the scribes and Pharisees in that day, if you'd been part of that culture and someone asked you, hey, who's the really spiritual people around here? I mean, like if God likes anybody around here, who's the people that God really likes? The people that are really nailing it, the people that understand and have this whole church thing or this whole worship thing worked out. Who are the people that are the best of the best, the spiritual elite? And, and anyone, everyone would have pointed to these guys. They said, well, it starts with the scribes and Pharisees. I mean, they're, they're the ones that know the law the best. They understand what God wants the most. They know all the rules. They know exactly what we're supposed to do. They know exactly what we're not supposed to do. And honestly, they do it better than any of us, man. They, they do everything. Look how they carry themselves. They've got the fancy robes. They've got all of these things. They go to all the worship services and they, they give. In fact, they make sure everyone knows they give as they go to the worship services as they give. And they, they do all of the different things that they're supposed to do and they're the leaders in the church services they're up in front in front of everyone and they know the bible better than everyone and then those are the ones that are the best of the best and then when jesus comes onto the scene it doesn't seem like jesus and the quote-unquote spiritual elite get along real well it seems like there's something about the spiritual elite that jesus is teaching rubs against in a way that they're not comfortable with and As he begins to point out like, yeah, 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 it's not about all the things you're doing on the outside, but let's talk about some heart issues that are going on. Let's talk about not what you're doing on the outside, but what's going on. What's your motives for everything that you're doing on the inside and and how do those things actually play out? Man, it starts to become really difficult. And the scribes and Pharisees are suddenly in a little bit of a pinch because they're watching this guy who's a nobody from nowhere in their mind and he's gaining a following. He's getting popular. People are listening to him and people are flocking to him. His, his following is growing and growing. At first, it was easy to ignore because he's out in the hills, the villages, in the middle of nowhere. And really, most of the people that are wanting to go hear him talk, they're nobodies too. They're farmers, they're fishermen, and some of them are the worst sinners you've ever seen. Prostitutes are going to listen to him. Like this kind of stuff, tax collectors, people that are like the scum of the earth are drawn to him. So it's really easy to ignore that guy when it's all about that, but it, it's, it's growing. And then he started doing things like, oh, I don't know, raising people from the dead. That gets attention. He starts feeding the 5,000 with just a little bit. He starts doing all these amazing things. And so now he doesn't just have a message to give to people but, but he's got this mercy act alongside of it. And as his ministry of proclaiming the kingdom of God combines with these merciful acts that display what the kingdom of God is intended to look like one day, man, when people see this, they're blown away. Now, granted, some are drawn to him for the wrong reasons. Some are going there just because they want what they can get from him. But that doesn't really matter to the Pharisees and the scribes. All they know is there's a huge crowd following him. And the things that he's saying, especially his little barbs about the religious elite and saying things like, you guys do everything right on the outside, but on the inside, you're like rotten, decaying. You're full of dead men's bones. Everybody thinks you're all holy and spiritual, but inside, you know different. You know that you're dead. And as he's saying things like that, these scribes and Pharisees have a little bit of an issue. Now, we know the story. Eventually, they begin to say, how can we literally get rid of him? We want to kill him, and it will lead to the cross where Jesus Christ is crucified for things he did not do by those very people. But at this particular point in the story, they're just trying to expose him. They want to show everybody, like, listen, you guys think you can trust this guy? He doesn't know what you think he knows. He's not as holy as you think he is. His motives are not the same. He's kind of, he's not what you think he is. It's kind of the exact same accusation that Jesus is actually pointing out against the scribes and Pharisees. And so they're trying to turn the tables on him and trap him and prove that he's not who he says he is. So in chapter 11, he comes in in the triumphant entry into Jerusalem and all these people are like coming out of the woodworks and worshiping and his disciples are saying all these things that sound like they're saying he's the king, he's Jesus. I mean, he's, he's the son of God himself, he's the Messiah. And now the temperature is like really ramping up and these guys are like, we have to get rid of him. So they come up with these series of questions in front of other people that they can ask. Now, their questions 
questions are not questions because they actually want to know the answers. Their questions are more like we want to trap him, make sure that what, he, what we think he's going to say he says, and it exposes to everybody else what a fraud he is. That's what they're trying to do. And so they go through a different series of stuff and they talk about taxes and Caesar. That was a hot button topic because the Jewish people are under oppression to the people of Rome or to the Roman government now. And so they're having to pay taxes and all this kind of stuff. And they keep trying to trap him. And Jesus is so full of wisdom. He handles all these things so well. And then in verse 28, one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. See, so they hear this argument going on among the followers of Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees and back and forth. They're arguing over all these different topics. They're arguing about taxes. They're arguing about the resurrection. They're arguing about theological matters. They're arguing about social matters. They're arguing about all this kind of stuff. And this one scribe's in there and he sees all this fighting going on. And he asks actually a really, really good question. It says, As he saw that they were disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? So he's watching the arguments over all these things and he kind of just really gets down to the baseline of it. And he goes, all of these things, Jesus, what do you think is the most important thing that we need to be talking about? Like what's the most important thing? Number one on the priority list out of all this kind of stuff. And Jesus answered, the most important is Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So he says to him, and he quotes an Old Testament passage that is a big deal to the Jewish people. He says, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The most important thing you can do, no matter what all these other taxes and the resurrection, all these things that we're debating, do you love God? That's number one. Love God with a genuine, with all your heart love, not a parsed out love, not a, I love God a little, but I also love football. Not that kind of love, like love God. And then he says, and it's interesting, they only asked him for the most important, but he says, there's actually two. And the second one he says is, you need to love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor with the same kind of love that you would love yourself. I mean, everybody loves themselves, right? Now, I don't mean necessarily all on a narcissistic love level, right? But everyone wants to take care of themselves. Everyone wants to feed the things that we're hungry for. Everyone wants the best for ourselves. Everyone has hopeful expectations for ourselves. Everyone wants to see ourselves do better and better. Everyone, I hope, is willing to take care of themselves in a certain way. Like, self-love comes pretty natural to all of us. In a lot of ways, it's our biggest problem, but that's a whole other sermon. But will you love your neighbor like that? Will you love the person next to you like that? The next door neighbor or the other neighbor or you gotta remember because others would argue like, so then who is our neighbor and what's the story that Jesus tells? Anyone know? It's called the story of the good Samaritan where he talks about a Samaritan who was one of the most hated and it's a racial hatred actually, a hated group of people by the Jewish people and he says to them, who's your neighbor? Well, it's like that guy and points to the one of the most hated people that they actually have. He's, that's your neighbor. Because it's really, you gotta, you gotta answer that question, right? Love your neighbor. Well, if you like your next door neighbor, that's easy. But Jesus expands the boundaries on that, doesn't he? And he says, no, you have to love other people. Even people that don't necessarily live geographically right next door to you. Even people that don't look like you. Even people that don't act like you. Even people that aren't from where you're from. You need to love those people with the exact same sort of passion and fervor that you love yourself. And he says, there is no other commandment greater than these. Now remember, these are people that are priding themselves on, oh, we follow all the commandments because we tithe. We go to synagogue. We go to the services. We read the Bible, we memorize the scripture, we do all these different things. And Jesus says, but do you love God? Like, do you love God? And does that love of God bleed out into loving other people around you, even those who are completely and totally different from you? And he says, there's nothing more important than that. 
Church, you hear that? There's nothing more important than those two things, amen? Like we all know that, right? Well, let's keep going. So the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there's no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. You hear what he's saying? He admits, he's like, you know what, Jesus, you're right. All the churchy things that we might do, all the sacrifices, all the worship services, all of those things, as great as they are, as important as they are, they pale in comparison to loving God and loving others as ourselves. So there's like a rare agreement between two parties on this thing, which must mean it's true. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. What a great line to hear there, right? Like, oh man, you're right there. Now we know the peace that's still gonna be missing is the understanding of who Jesus Christ is, whose kingdom this is, and how access to that kingdom comes through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's what he's talking about when he says, you're not far off. But that's a great thing to say like, oh man, you're getting it. Like, when you understand the importance of loving God and the importance of loving your neighbors yourself, like you, you are, man, that's the kingdom of God, like right there in your hands. It's, it's there. You get it. And everybody else hears all this, and what's their response? And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. Because you can't argue that, right? No, we should hate people. Like, you, you can't argue that. Even if you want to hate people, you can't say that, so you just shut up, right? So what does that have to do with today? Well, uh, for those of you that are visiting us today, I'm glad you're here. Um, we are going through a series here this summer that's called Mythbusters. Now, typically, what we do is we choose a certain passage of the Bible, like the, we'll be starting on September 15th, we'll start the book of Acts, and we'll just spend a season working through the entire book of Acts, verse by verse, looking at everything that takes place in there. We just finished the book of Luke, worked through all that for a very, very long time to finish that one. Um, but this summer, we're just taking a little bit of a break and doing something a little different, and we're taking on this series called Mythbusters. And the idea is each week we take one common misconception, whether it be something that people inside the church believe or something that people outside the church believe about the church or about God or about Christianity or about the Bible, something that is a commonly held misconception that might well, that definitely does not square with what the scriptures actually teach. And so each week we try to take one of these, we try to look at it, understand it, analyze it. We wanna look at the scriptures and go, well then what do the scriptures actually say? And why is the truth in scripture better than the lie that people want to believe? That's our goal. And we've covered a whole lot of stuff. I know we have our little exercise that we've practiced where we go through all the different ones and you guys say false, but for the sake of time this morning, I'm gonna forego all of that kind of stuff. You can go check that out online and I encourage you to go back and listen to some of those if you've missed. It's been a really fun season, I think, doing this. Have you guys enjoyed actually the Mythbusters thing? Amen? Yeah, a lot of you have. It's been really fun. Um, so I wanna remind you though of something before we go on on this one. Sometimes those things that we tackle are things we believe because we want to, and when someone pokes a hole in them, we get uncomfortable. Uh, it, we can get our toes stepped on. I remember when I was in Africa this year, we were teaching a group of pastors, and actually it was Aaron Beamish, our executive pastor here at Heritage, that was teaching, and he was teaching about accountability with money and about how um, the pastors of the churches there, they need to have teams of people that help oversee the finances there, so it's not just like one guy who's in charge of all the money, and then people are wondering like what happens with it and all that, and he was sharing with them what we do and the, the different accountability systems that we have and who sees money and how it gets counted and all those kind of things. And I remember noticing like usually when we teach, it's met very favorably and people are like nodding heads and like amen and clapping and all this kind of stuff. That was not happening while Aaron was giving this whole sermon about all this. And you could tell there was great discussion going on. And so when Aaron finished his session and he prayed, he said amen. And there was like intense discussion among some of the pastors that were there in the room. And so I walked up to the front and Aaron and his translator were there. And we pulled the translator aside and said, hey man, people seem like they're really worked up about this particular topic. There's a lot of discussion going on. What, what's happening? And he said, oh, you have poked the lion in the eye. Because <laughs> there's not a lot of financial accountability over there. So 
Sometimes in our topics, there's things that might step on toes. This one could for some of you. I mean, this topic's actually become very politicized in a lot of ways, and unfortunately, too often, we, the church, marry politics and the church in ways that aren't healthy, and so instead of looking at seeing what the scriptures say, we feel like we don't want to take steps that direction because it feels apolitical to what our movements actually are, and this can be one, can be. Hopefully, none of you have your toes stepped on off this topic. Hopefully, everyone is in agreement of all this, and we're just celebrating and agreeing on God's word and worshiping together. But the idea is this, and this is the myth, that Christianity is bigoted and close-minded. Now, that's a huge subject. When I chose this topic for this week, I didn't think it through (laughs) because that's a massive topic. And there's two different dynamics to that. There's close-minded regarding people or groups of people, say races or women or whatever, And then there's closed-mindedness over topics or theology or uh, moral law or things such as that. And so in looking at this and considering it, we realize like this is way too big of a topic for us to tackle this morning in both both aspects. So here's what we're doing. Uh, Jeremy, Pastor Jeremy here, just wrote a blog article that'll get released, I think, today. And his blog article is going to attack the issue of closed-mindedness regarding, say, theology or where are the things that we do want to be rigid and say, no, we are unbudging on these sorts of things. That'll be on the blog article and there might be opportunity for more discussion and exploration on some of those things later. I'm going to talk about this morning the idea of Christianity being bigoted and closed-minded regarding people. So we're talking about races, we're talking about women children, slaves. We're talking about uh, nationalities, which was a big issue there, Jew versus Gentile. There were major racial issues that took place, nationalism, all of those sorts of things. We're talking about specifically people, or as I believe Jesus would say, your neighbor. Because the truth is there is a huge reputation out there or at least the narrative is among many, many people, not just in our world, but especially in our country, that the Christian church, especially the evangelical Christian church, is bigoted, we are either racist, or we are sexist, we oppress women, or we oppress cultures, or we're homophobic, or whatever the case may be, and that we are an exclusive organization that has a very much us and them attitude. And that's the narrative that's out there. Now, before we go down this road, let me encourage you. Some of you will go, well, I'm not that way. Okay, praise God. That's how they think you are, though. And so we still need to understand it because in many cases, uh, what's the thing? Perception becomes reality. Not that you really did it, but that people view you and act and treat the church as if it is true. So we can't just go, nope, wasn't me, and walk away and pretend that it never actually happened, right? But that is the narrative that's out there. Um, Many people today believe that the church, and this is a big one, that the church became something very different than what it was supposed to be under Jesus Christ, who taught love your neighbor as yourself. That somewhere along the line, the church moved out of being house churches and being an underground movement, and it ended up becoming a power movement once Rome changed and Christianity became kind of the national religion. Suddenly, Christianity became something of power. And Christianity became the thing where, especially in most of the narratives that you'll hear about, it's the white male dominated Christian power structure that says, okay, this is how it is. And they'll control it and it's exclusive and beating people down or keeping women in oppression. Like that's what a ton of people, especially in our post-Christian, post-modern world believes about the church, that we are oppressive to women. We've been oppressive to other ethnicities and races. And today, especially regarding things like homosexuality, gender issues, that the church is homophobic and hates those that refuse to or aren't living in accordance to the scriptures or the, the, uh, uh, the moral principles that the church supports. Whether you believe that or not, and I pray no one here does, you know people that think this about us, right? That's a real narrative about the church. It's a real common narrative about the church. And so for some, they see it, like I said, as an issue of power. Others just see it plain plain as day as just an issue of racism and hatred. Whether they want to go tie it to like Old South burning crosses in the KKK or whatever the case may be, even anti-Semitism. 
It's a very, very commonly held notion about the church that's out there. And so we need to understand, we need to think about this because in the eyes of the world, we are racist, we are sexist, we're homophobic, all these kind of things. And it has, whether we want it to or not, become a polarized world where it is us and them. That's the truth. We may not see it that way. They may not intend to. But that's what happens just naturally as that narrative exists out there. So what's the truth? Is the, is the church or has the church been bigoted and closed-minded? Well, that's complicated. That's complicated. It depends on who you're talking about and when you're talking about it and where you're talking about the church as a whole. It's very complicated and, and our history has elements of both sides. So I'll give you an example. Let's talk about slavery, for example. That's the big one that much of the world would point to in terms of uh, America and the church's involvement in these sort of issues in our own history, right? So let's talk about the notion of slavery. In uh, 1847, two men uh, were commissioned to write a report regarding slavery and theology and to decide, is slavery supposed to be a Christian? Like, can we defend in theology slavery? Does God allow slavery or not? And, and then the other guy was supposed to say, like, he, he was giving sort of the rebuttal to that. So two people uh, were chosen. First was a guy named Richard Fuller, a well-known Baptist pastor at the time. And the other guy was Francis Wayland. He was the president of Brown University at the time. And so they wrote and commissioned this paper that you can still find and still read out there that was entitled, Domestic Slavery Considered as a Spiritual Institution. So they were trying to debate, hey, slavery exists as spiritual people, is that okay or not? And so here's what happened. I know, like, I, I hope most of us all agree now, like, ah, slavery's bad. Like, that's easy to agree with. But I want you to consider the things people were thinking of and how they would use the scripture to justify the things that are happening. Because in, in the eyes of many people in the world around us, that still is how we look at things. So it's good for us to understand that. So first came uh, Mr. Fuller. Fuller wrote, to defend slavery as a Christian institution. And he made five specific arguments. He said, number one, he said, the Old Testament tolerates slavery. And he quoted Leviticus 25, 44, that says, you may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are all around you. That's a tough passage in a lot of people's minds. I mean, think right now, church, if an unbeliever came to you right now and said, you're a Christian, how, do you, how can you believe the Bible? You believe every word of the Bible? Well, what about this word? You may buy male and female slaves among the nations that are around you? What do you think about that? Could you answer that? Like, that's a tough one. Number two, he said this. He said, the New Testament tolerates and regulates slavery. He said, the Old Testament condoned it. The New Testament tolerated it, didn't support it, but it condoned it and it added regulations. And so his argument was, it can't be evil if God allowed it. So therefore, it's still part of our spiritual institutions today. Number three, he said, if Jesus or Paul had ever wanted to outlaw the institution of slavery, they could have done so immediately. And then number four, the morality of slavery is no defense for his abuses. He said, abuses of slavery don't mean that the institution as a whole should get along. So just because one guy beats his doesn't mean I can't have mine. That was the mentality that, that he actually had. And so, I'm sorry, I told you it was five points, just four points. So, so Wayland writes a response to this. And he comes in and he writes, number one, slavery is a clear violation of Matthew 19, 19. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The passage we just read in Mark's account as well. He said, it is impossible to say slavery's okay when this clearly says, how, how can you love your neighbor as yourself when you maintain your own freedom and deny someone else theirs? And his, his hermeneutic to that, his way of understanding the Bible was to say, look, when there are things in the scripture that are sort of unclear, always make sure you're going back to that which is crystal clear and use that to understand the things that are maybe more foggy in our understanding. And he said, that one's pretty clear. Love your neighbor as yourself. He went on to say, Old Testament slavery is to be understood in the context of Israel's unique place in history. 
And he talked about the context, and there's not time for us to go down this road, but I would encourage you, if you don't understand it, please go learn the understanding, or get understanding about the context of slavery in the Old Testament, because most people look at Old Testament slavery through the eyes of the American slavery experience, and the two are nowhere near like each other. And what God was doing was, as that slavery institution was used in in Israel, it was to be used in such a way that people were set free. The problem is, Israel just never did it. So what God's law demanded, they never actually held through with. It was more of a bond servant. It was like, if you're broke and you're homeless and you have no way of supporting your family, you could go and become a, if you will, slave to the person, to some rich man, whatever. You're basically just become an employee there and he takes care of your family as you work for him for an agreed upon period of time. The problem was it just didn't always go down that way. Number three, like polygamy, Slavery is a sinful behavior that is regulated, not endorsed in the Old Testament. And he would go to point out and say, hey, just because there's laws about something or something regulating something is very different than whether God actually endorses something or not. And Israel was becoming a very unique cultural institution in that day. And then number four, he said, the New Testament never tolerates slavery and its principles demand slavery's demise. His point was, you can take a passage out of context and you can say, see, look what you Christians believe, but you can't read the Bible and then listen to that verse being taken out of context and say, yeah, God's okay with that. And so there was this argument that took place. So is the church bigoted and closed-minded? Has the church been guilty of those sorts of things? Yeah, it has. And it's also played a role in undoing some of those things. Um, Even consider women, for example, right? So is the church closed-minded regarding women? Have women been uh, oppressed and held down because of the church? Well, historically, there's a guy named Celsus who is a second century uh, detractor of the faith, as they called him. In other words, this, he lived in the second century at the time of the early church, and he hated the church. And so he was writing about the church, and here's what he actually said about the church. The church only attracts the silly, the mean, and the stupid, and women and children. That was what he said. The church is a bunch of silly, stupid, mean people and a bunch of women and children. And it's true. The early church was disproportionately female. Do you know why? Well, number one, men held all the positions of power in that day. And to convert from either Judaism or to to speak out against Rome and claim to be a Christian would cause you to lose your power position wherever it was. So in many cases, women claimed and followed Jesus and their husbands or the men who were in those positions were unwilling to give up their positions of power in their life and follow. So the church grew massively with women more than men in those days. And the second reason that the church became so disproportionately female, people killed babies regularly and the church stopped it. Like people regularly would kill babies, especially female babies, because in that culture, that added nothing financially to your bottom line. It was another mouth to feed that didn't benefit you at all. And so the church, literally, there's stories, you can read about them, that they would go around and rescue babies that had been abandoned and put them in homes of other Christians to save them. And all these babies that had been completely abandoned were raised by families in the church rather than left discarded on the streets, most of which were women. So the early church was actually primarily women. Now, did it stay? Oh, and I should say this as well. A lot of the women in the early church Oftentimes, there were these women who were uh, either educated or from positions of influence who they had come to the church and whether their husbands did or not, they took seriously passages like Titus that talk about how the older women are to train and disciple the young women. And so you had this weird dynamic in the church that was happening nowhere else in anywhere else in the world where older educated women began training young uneducated women in the scriptures. So much so that in the early 400s, Augustus you guys know Augustine? He actually was writing about the church and talking about it, and he said, any woman in the church is vastly more educated in spiritual things than the greatest philosophers among our day. So women were incredibly welcomed. So has the church never oppressed women? Oh man, I wish that were true. I wish that were true. But it's true. It still happens to this day. 
taking passages like women are to submit to their husbands as if that's some sort of like hierarchy where men are superior to women. Therefore, woman, you need to stay submitted. You need to stay in the kitchen, barefoot, pregnant. You just take care of things here. Lay the rest of your life aside and you'll do whatever I tell you to do whenever I tell you to do it. And you have to because the Bible says so. That happens still. And some of you have seen it. Some of you may have grown up in it. It happens. So it's complicated to say, is the church this? Here's the better way of saying it. The church as an institution is not racist, bigoted, or closed-minded. But people in the church sometimes are. People inside the organization of the church. The church as it is designed and intended by God is supposed to be that which empowers the weak. I mean, just... Just think about this. Think about a guy, the the guy who was writing earlier, by the way, about uh, why slavery should be a Christian institution. He would go on later to defend it and he would talk about how he took care of his own slaves that he owned at the time. And he would say things like, hey, I take care of my slaves. I feed them, I give them homes, I make sure the kids have clothes. It sounds like someone taking care of a pet. Like that's really what it sounded like because that was the mentality then. The problem was, They didn't see the African Americans that were there. They just saw them as slaves. They were property. They were not image bearers created in the image of God with a certain degree of dignity given their life by God. Their worth was completely based upon how much they profited from that person in their economic system. And so think about that. Think about the wickedness of using a gospel institution as a position of power. Because remember what the gospel is. The God of all creation, of ultimate power, ultimate wealth, ultimate influence, ultimate glory, set all of that aside to become poor, to live homeless. Why? To rescue the wretched, the poor, and the broken like you and me. And so then to be saved into that institution where power is set aside to reach out, or maybe you would better say, Power is used to rescue the weak and now you're going to be in an institution and use your power to keep the weak subjugated? That is wicked and horribly evil to do. And it's happened historically. It's sad to say it has happened historically. And whether it's happening today or not, whether slavery is now gone and why is everybody all upset, whatever the mentality might be or not, a lot of people in the world still believe that those same things are true. There are people everywhere in our culture even today that think that if slavery were still okay, if we could bring it back, they think that Heritage right now would vote in favor of that. That's the, that's the perception among many, many people. So here's the issue. In a topic like this, we could talk about We could get all like apologetic about it. Apologetic means defending the faith. We could go through, no, look how Christianity has stood up for those who are weak. Look how Christianity today with abortion is standing up for the weak. Look how Christianity has empowered women. We could defend all of those kinds of things. Or we can just talk about maybe what should the church do just moving forward because it's really hard to change some of those things in the past. And it's really hard. I I mean, you guys, you watch social media, right? Is anyone arguing anyone into the church ever? Or into anything? Has a, has a Republican ever argued a Democrat into the Republican convention? Like, have they ever been like, man, I see all your arguments and you are right. I am out of here. Get out of here, donkey. I'm grabbing my elephant. Like, have you ever seen that? Or vice versa? It doesn't happen. So I, I, just, I just have a few things that I just want to kind of walk through. Just a few different thoughts that I want to encourage you guys to consider. Number one is this, I think it is important for us as a church to understand and admit not only that historically these things have happened, but there's still some in the church who still hold bigoted and closed-minded views regarding groups of people that are out there. And, And some of you might be here. Like some of you might be just bristling even that I'm talking about this. And I, I, I just want to encourage you to understand the beauty of the scriptures that, that a God became a man who, who was not a white American and set all of his power aside to save wretches like you and me. 
Like that's got to change the way that we look at people. And, and the Bible teaches us that we are to not to see people by our differences anymore, but that we are to find inherent value in people based on the reality that every human being is an image bearer of God himself. Every human being. This side is with me today. So let's look at what the scriptures do say. Take a look at Galatians 3, verse 28 through 29. We've got, I think, the text for the screen here. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female for you are all. Now, that's not like gender issues today, guys, just so you know. But this is what he's saying. You are all what? Say it again. You are all what? Hey, listen. It doesn't say the same. Just this week at the Acts 29 conference, man, what a great time that was in Orlando this week as my wife and I and, and Pastor Sam and his wife got to go. And, and even the worship team was assembled by people from other countries all over the world. And we would have like African style worship one session and American style worship one session. And it was just awesome. And then Doug Logan, who's the, um, he kind of heads up the Acts 29 Network's diversity initiative. He, he spoke a little bit about diversity and about the things that the, um, that the church in the Acts 29 Network is doing to empower pastors in some of the hardest to reach places, inner city areas, Africa, other areas, and to raise, raise up indigenous pastors who can go into those areas. And, and he was talking about, and this is what he said, and I, I won't forget it. It was such a great thing. He said, listen, the Bible calls us to oneness, not sameness. And that's a big, 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 big distinction. We are one unified by the blood of Christ. I think he put it this way. (laughs) Once you're inside the church, you guys know, I know none of you would ever watch such a thing, but you know the Mari Povich thing where they do like the daddy test, DNA test, are you the father, all that kind of stuff. He was like, listen, in the DNA parental test for everyone inside the church of Jesus Christ, that blood test always proves that we are sons of God. It does not talk, it doesn't just separate us by other distinctions. And so once we're in family, we are one in the family of God, but we're different. We're really different, and that's okay. In fact, it's really, really good. But we are no longer to see people based on, oh, he's Jewish, or he's this, or he's black, or he's white, or he's slave, or he's free, or he's male, or he's female. And it doesn't mean we don't see the realities of the differences. What it means is we are not judging people and assigning worth and value based on these things. We are seeing people as image bearers of God who Jesus died on the cross to save and adopt us and bring us into the same family with. Amen? That there's an inherent value in every single person that walks the earth, especially those that are part of the family of God, because you're now their brother and sister. And so we need to remember that. And we need to also remember, by the way, under the same topic, our propensity to drift even when we believe these things. It's a topic that we could go way more into, but you guys know the story where Peter has the dream about the blanket comes down with all the, all the animals in it. And, and he says, hey, all of these things are now clean. And, and the whole interpretation of this was that now the gospel that had been presented to the Jews was gonna go to the Gentile nations. It's the best news ever because it's the reality that, hey, because of that dream, Jesus was saying, hey, I died to save Jeff too. And it's this beautiful thing where finally this gospel is open to everyone, not just the Jewish people. And then a little bit later, you see Paul chewing out Peter. Why? He's like, hey, why are you going back to some of this Jewish exclusivity? Why are you now making the people who aren't Jewish act just like the Jewish people? Why are you going to these feasts and doing all this stuff with them that you had just rejected before? The gospel frees us of all that. Peter, knock it off. Peter had drifted. And our propensity can be that sort of birds of a feather flock together. We need to understand that, especially in an area that lacks diversity like Southern Oregon, it's really easy to start forgetting that there's a much bigger world out there and that God has other bigger things in store, but we don't have time to go down that road, so we won't. Number two. There are a ton of people in the church that are willing to argue against accusations of bigotry instead of just living in a way to to prove that they aren't. And and let me say it like this. Church, like, stop debating. (laughs) Just stop debating. Instead, live in such a way that your life and your love for others is undebatable. That's way easier 
Like, instead of just being apologetic about what has happened in the past and all that kind of stuff, because now I grew up in North Carolina, and I grew up in an area that was a little more overtly racist, especially back then, as it is, uh, or th- than maybe Southern Oregon was, or maybe where some of you were from. But I would hear people all the time talk about, like, listen, racism's over. Why don't they just get over it? And they would argue all these historic things but never reach across the aisle, never go over to that person, never integrate with, never show any expressions of love with any of the people that are there. It's sort of like a defense on this side, but never willing to step into the context of anyone else and actively show love the way Jesus stepped into our context. And, and this is just what I would say, live in such a way, I mean, just even think of Jesus's arguments here. Like he's talking about, man, it, it, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And then even the people who wanted to kill Jesus at the end of that were like, well, we can't really argue with that. We'll just go come up with something different. And I mean, if if that's what you do, you won't need to argue on social media about social issues. Your love and concern for others will be so known. And what do the scriptures say? That they will know that we are Christians by our love one for another, not our strict moral moral compass or our what we do or what we don't do or any of that kind of stuff or even be known by our history they will know us by our love one for another so I just want to encourage you love people who are different than you like pursue opportunities to love those who are different from you number three the church cannot fall into uh, um, the trap of whether you want to call it tribalism or polarization that the whole world has fallen into today. And this is what I mean by that. We live in a world that says, unless you believe exactly like me, you are not, not only do we not agree on that, but we're not even friends. Like, if you don't have my political beliefs, you're a monster and I cannot associate with you. And we will separate over things all the time. And here's the thing. Now, Jeremy will be writing in the blog, there are things that the church does need to hold to, okay? I, I understand that. But here's the thing. The church is not called to be some fortress. We're called to actually go out and be on mission and loving people. And so if we sit back and become polarized, us and them, the way so much of the world is today, you're never gonna bring anybody to Jesus, like we, we have to love people. It's not an option for us. We are commanded by God to love people. And let me say this, even those who would say that the church is racist or bigoted or whatever. In other words, let me put it this way. Church, we don't have enemies, really. We have people who are imprisoned and lost and need mercy and need the love of Jesus. Because we're not just commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves, we're commanded to love our enemies. And, and then we're following the example of Jesus Christ who laid his life down and died on the cross while we were enemies of him, Romans chapter five says. That's our leader. Our leader died for people who aren't like him, didn't deserve him, and were enemies with him. He laid his life down and died for them. That's our leader, that's who we follow. So our lives kind of have to look that way. That's the movement that we are a part of, amen? Amen, we don't have the luxury of separating from people because we have the mission of engaging them and saving them. Number four, a diverse church is a more complete picture of God. And I I got to see this this week in in Orlando, but, but here's the idea, think of it like this. If all human beings are created in the image of God, then that means all human beings have something about them that is displaying, that is, that is almost preaching a gospel or, or that is pointing or educating us, l- helping us to learn something of God. And if everybody was the same, we would not have the same whole picture of who God is that we do if we will listen to, learn, and love those that are very, very different from us. And, and, and that's just like marriage 101, right? Because in most marriages, I don't want to get too broad brush here and be accused of being sexist, but men have certain characteristics that are really different than the characteristics that women have. And there are things that we can learn from both of them in many cases that actually display and manifest the character of God. 
be it his strength, whichever side of that marriage equation it is. I've, I know some, some women that are incredibly strong. I, I don't say that in any way because we tend to go, oh, they're just, the women are the soft ones and the men are the hard ones. And it's not exactly the case. In many cases, it's the exact opposite. But we learn from both. We see motherly nurturing. We see fathers. We see all of these different things that we learn about God through the diversity and through the fact that there's differences among all of us. And I would say we learn all that, not just in a male-female way, but think about those of you that have been to Africa with us. Like you've seen what it means to have joy in the Lord in a worship service in Uganda. Amen? Like that's real. We learn something about that. Uh, In Europe right now, Church, we can learn a whole lot from our European brothers and sisters on what it's like to be Christians in a very post-Christian world because America seems to be headed that way. And so there's things about God we learn from our brothers and sisters there. I mean, right now, even speaking of differences, like in in the music culture, I was just talking to Mitch this week about uh, Christian music. So Christian music was like all the Gaithers for a long, long time, right? If you don't know the Gaithers, you are probably... I don't want to say lucky. Some of you guys love the Gaithers. I don't like the Gaithers. Anyway, it was like all Gaithers and stuff, right? And then there was like this explosion and all of a sudden there's like rock bands that were Christian bands. Now, I know they were pretty rough at first. There was like Petra and all those kind of, I know that was tough, but it actually got pretty good for a little while. And you had like bands coming out that at the time were really good from like Third Day, Newsboys. We even had like metal bands like Pillar and Thousand Foot Crunch, Crunch, Crutch, Thousand Foot Crutch. Like all these bands that were really, really good. But Christian music now has evolved again, and that's sort of all gone. And now, pretty much, there's only two real types of Christian music that are out there, at least in ter- that, that have any sort of popularity that is out there. There's worship and praise music, which thank God for that. We use a lot of those songs. And there's hip hop and rap. There's not a lot of Christian rock bands out there anymore. There's not a lot of Christian, you know, any of those other bands. But I'll tell you, if you haven't listened or looked into what happens, the deepest richest, most deep theological music being made out there is Christian rap and hip hop, and it's not even close. Like it's, ri- it's, it's really a musical format that is made, it's like scripture. And it's hugely popular, and it's invading cultures and inner city areas and urban dynamics that had been completely separated from Christian music for a long, 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 long time. Man, we can learn from those things and celebrate the differences and praise God for using all of the different things. That's the beauty of different, not same, but one under God. And so a diverse church is a better church because it's a better picture of who God is. And then the last one is this one, and I'm done. Heaven itself will be incredibly diverse. Will you look at Revelation chapter 7? Beginning in verse nine. This is a scene in heaven after Jesus Christ is displayed as the lamb, the one who could take the seal, the one who could open the scroll, the one who has saved all of humanity. There's this incredible scene that takes place in heaven. And it says, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne, before the lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing, glory, wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. In heaven, do you see that, guys? There's a multitude that no one can number. And he says, there's people from every tribe, from every nation, every language, people from every corner of the world, arguably historically, the vast majority of which will not look like the the vast majority of us in this room do. And we will all be gathered together as one before the Lamb and before God, and we will be worshiping, and we will be singing. You're going to hear different languages. You're going to hear different tongues. I'm, sh- I'm totally convinced there will be understanding of all of that. And maybe for the first time with pure hearts, without 
the wicked, selfish hearts that we all have, we are gonna see one another as brothers and sisters united by Jesus Christ on the throne. That is absolutely, I don't care what your theologies are, what your beliefs are on any of those kind of things, that is inarguably, truly going to happen. So you can wait till then, and it'll be a little shocking, and you'll be like the worst dancer in the group, (laughs) <laughs> <You'll>, <laughs> or, or whatever the case may be, you, you can wait till then. Or you can take Jesus' words seriously now and go, you know what, man, we, we, have been, we have been saved by a great God. Right, church? Like a great God who loves us, though we are nothing. We are so different from him, and we are so beneath him and so unworthy of him, and yet he gave his only son to die for us. And he created this multicultural adoption center that's called the church. And he brought all these different people, not just saving him and saying, I like you too, but brought them into his family, brought them into his home. People just like you and me. And then we can go, and man, because of that, this, these are people that God died for. How can I not love them and show them too? Oh, sure, there's going to be political arguments, and sure, diversity can be a buzzword because in our day and age, tolerance means we give up our beliefs to accept everybody, and of course we don't believe that. Of course we stand on the scriptures, but we never need to forget the greatest commandment are these. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Heritage, listen, love God. Like, love God more than you love doing things for God. Love God more than you go, love going to church for God. Love God with everything that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. Whether they be on the news arguing against your belief system, whether they be accusing you of things that you never did, man, Jesus understands all that, amen? Amen whether they point fingers that aren't true, whether they point fingers that are true, whatever the case may be, we have not been given the luxury to write people off as as enemies or as idiots or as opposition. We've been given the mission to carry the love of Jesus Christ to every person in every nation, in every tribe, and in every language on earth. And the beauty is, is that as we do so and we meet our brothers and sisters all over, man, we learn a lot more about God. So let's, let's grow in that I mean, in our culture, that's different, right? Diversity here in our area area is a little bit different, but it it, it doesn't have to be a skin color thing, man. Like, love everyone that you're around. Here, it's usually less African-American. There's Hispanic cultures that are growing here. There's a Korean culture in Southern Oregon that's growing here. Whatever the case may be, man, love people who are different from you. And really, the easiest way to say it is just this. Love everybody. That's pretty simple, right? Love God love everybody. Amen? Well, guys, right now, we're actually going to transition into worship and communion as we close now. So at this point, there's opportunity for you guys to come forward and have a meal with Jesus. And here at the table, we have bread representing the broken body of Jesus Christ who died for us, who, who was broken for our sins and transgressions. And then in the cup, there's this juice, this, this drink, if you will, that's a, a picture of the blood of Jesus Christ that was poured out for us. And this right here is where, this is where coexist happens truly, right? This is where world peace can actually happen when we come together at the foot of the cross because at the foot of the cross we realize, and this is, this is why Paul can say there's no more Jew or Greek or male or female or any of that because at the foot of the cross we are all equal. We realize at the foot of the cross that we are all guilty and we are, have all been graced and adopted into the family of God, not because of who we are or what we look like or what we've done, but because Jesus Christ poured his blood out for us. So I wanna encourage you and come to the table and think about who you can love. Think about who you can display. Like, let's write a different narrative for people that we interact with in the city around us, amen? Let's love God this morning with all our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. And then let's love our neighbor as ourselves as we leave this place. God, may you be honored in our worship right now. God, may you be honored as we gather together. Lord, this world needs you. Just just yesterday, this shooting in Texas, which appears to be heavily racist, motivated act of wickedness. Lord, there's just so much brokenness all around us. And we can argue systemic things. We can argue what should or shouldn't be done to curtail it. But the reality is we know this. 
What we need more than anything, Jesus, is you to come and change the hearts of your people. So God, as we come to the table, God, I I pray, Lord, I, I pray for heart change even again this morning for all of us. Lord, even these things can be difficult for us to discuss, Lord, because sometimes admitting these things have happened before feels like we're accepting guilt. But the reality is at the cross, we have no place to boast. We come before you equal as broken sinners in need of your grace. And at the cross, Lord, we find redemption. We find forgiveness. Somehow you you adopt us into your family. You call us your sons. You call us perfect. I, I don't know how that works. I know this, Lord, we need it. So may you dine with your people as we come to the table this morning. And may you be honored by our worship this morning. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. At this time, if you want to have a meal with Jesus, we invite you, come to the communion table here in front of you and then return back and then stand and worship Jesus this morning. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here. I find my rest Without you I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart Lord, I need you is found is where you are and where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in me Lord I need you Oh 
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His cool to think about just that diversity of what worship's going to look like in heaven. Um, and we kind of get in a groove here where we do a lot of the same stuff, sing a lot of congregational worship songs, and those are awesome for sure. Um, but it's not the only way to worship. In fact, we preach over and over again that everything we do as the Bible teaches can be an act of worship. And it could look totally different for different people, totally different with people of different gifts. And uh, we have a lot of rad, awesome people at Heritage with a lot of different gifts. So we figured we'd mix it up a little bit this morning. Uh, and we have a treat for you guys. So Kira, can you please come up on stage for a second? Woo! This is Kira Brown. Hey, so... Um, we're excited. This last couple months, but more specifically the last week, we, um, we got together in, in Kiera by the power of the Spirit, we both believe for sure, um, wrote a little song for you guys. So we're excited to, uh, to do this with her and excited for the Lord to work. So be encouraged, guys. Tell you why a closed mind is hollow. We can't comprehend the transfiguration for the reconciliation. It's a deep rooted issue of feeling unloved, feeling forgotten. We can't understand God, so we put him in a box. We limit potential because we put him in a box. The I am that I am, maker of heaven and nurse as I can. But yet out of fear, I reject him when near. Wounds affect when they're not properly clean. Woo! This ain't apology. This is our history, this is theology, spiritual anomaly. Don't get it twisted, it ain't in astrology. Foretold by Jesus, don't be deceived by modern psychology. Don't be deceived by false doctors out there. Blindly to blind, simply impaired. Lord, I'm lost living without your love. We'll miss on something that we don't open up. It's not in the stars, it's on you all. And I can't do this by myself Here's to exposing the lies Here's to revealing the wise Here's to speaking the truth To glorify God when nobody tries And down here on earth I'm a tail shed to deliver us first Knowing the spiritual, knowing the worth Knowing that God says we win at the first This is apology This is our history This is theology Spiritual anomaly Don't get it twisted, it ain't an astrology Foretold by Jesus don't be deceived by modern psychology. Don't be deceived by false doctors out there. Blindly the blind, simply a pair. Can't do this by myself. 
here, come here, come here, come here. Kiera, Kiera, get back over here. Hey, I'm chasing you. Come here. Kiera, Jeff's chasing you. You guys, come here a second. Do you guys, you guys how, I mean, this is a little girl right here. You know how much guts and bravery that took to pull off. Like, I'm just so, thank you so much. Oh man, thank you so much. Yeah. She, uh, she helps out with our kids. She helps out with our kids and they did like, a, our youth group did like a talent night one night and my daughter comes home and is like, Dad, she can rap. And I was like, what? How do we not know this? <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for doing that. Hey guys, thank you guys so much. Have a great week. Man, go love God with everything you are and then love everybody else you come into contact as well. You are not far from the kingdom when you do those two things. Amen, church? Amen. Love you guys. Amen.